open our Bibles this morning to the book of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter number 10. Hebrews chapter number 10 is where we come in our study of the book of Hebrews. We're looking together this morning at verses 19 through 25. The title of the message today is How to Press On in the Gospel. How to Press On in the Gospel. And so let's look together at God's Word. Hebrews 10, 19, having therefore brothers boldness or confidence to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he hath consecrated for us, through the veil, that is his flesh, and since we have a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near. Let us draw near specifically to God with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast. Now some of your translations are going to say the profession of our faith, but most of you, if you have an updated translation, You're going to see that this phrase has been changed. The reason why it's been changed is because profession of faith is not in the original language. If you go back to the original manuscripts, you'll not find the Greek word pistos in any of this verse. What you will find, though, is the Greek word for hope. And so it's more accurately rendered and read, and I'm going to go with the accurate one this morning, which is let us hold fast the confession of our hope, our hope. You say, well, Pastor, what's the big deal? Well, number one, it's the Word of God that we're dealing with. So we want to make sure that we have an accurate understanding of the Word of God. Secondly, if it's faith, then the verse seems to indicate that you and I are responsible for holding on to our faith, that that we are responsible for our salvation in, in the realm of its security of it. Now, we know the Bible doesn't teach that. So it is more accurate to go back to what the actual language or actual manuscripts use is the word hope. Because our hope is not in our ability to hold on, our faith, our hope is in God's promise to hold on. So let us hold fast, look at it, verse 23, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, and here it is, here's the context, for he that is God is faithful. He is faithful, that promise. Verse 24, and let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some are doing, but rather exhorting one another, encouraging one another, and and let's do this more than we're doing it. (laughs) So much the more as we see the day, the day approaching. We're not... We're actually at an interesting point in our study here of the book of Hebrews. We're, We're moving here with these verses from the section of where the writer is explaining Jesus' priestly work, which has been the larger portion of our study of Hebrews, to now the section where he is showing us the application of Christ's priestly work in the Christian life. In, In other words, let's simplify this. Because of what Jesus Christ has done for us in becoming our high priest, shedding his blood for our sins and giving us access to the presence of God, this, which is verses 19 through 25, this, this is to be our response to him. Because of what Jesus has done, this is to be our response. So we've had the priestly work of Jesus explained to us. Now we apply it to our lives as we respond to the Lord. I think this is also a very good place to stop and just be reminded of the context of the letter of Hebrews. It's been quite a while since we've done that, since we began our study of Hebrews many, many months ago. But let us just remind ourselves as to why the writer is even pinning this letter. For one, Hebrews was written at a time when followers of Christ experienced heavy persecution. The threat of martyrdom or imprisonment was a very real life Christian experience. And as a result, these churches, these these people, they they were scared. 
Some had even began to drift away from Christ. They had began to turn away from the gospel that had been so faithfully taught to them. And as a result, their commitment to the scripture was questionable. Their faithfulness to assemble with the church was lacking. And the reality of their profession of faith in Christ was being truly tested. And so the overarching theme of Hebrews as we study the letter together is this. He's saying to us, in light of the circumstances around you, don't drift. Don't turn back. But rather, press on. And specifically, press on in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Don't drift. Don't turn back. Don't turn around. But no, go forward. Press on in the gospel of Jesus. Uh, my son, as soon as the uh, early service was over with, my, my oldest son, not my youngest son, I'd be pretty amazed if my youngest son did this, but my oldest son uh, came immediately up here uh, to the pulpit, which usually means one or two things. It could mean that his sister did something to him in the service, and he's fixing to tell me what she did. It also could mean that he's going to have this spiritual moment, and, I, and I'm thankful for these because he's very quiet when it comes to even his own relationship with God. And so he came up here and he said, Daddy, I learned something in the message today. I know what your sermon was all about. I said, yeah, what was my sermon all about? Don't quit. That's what it was about. I said, yep, took me 45 minutes to say that, but that's exactly what it's about. (laughs) Don't quit. Don't quit. And that's what the writer of Hebrews is saying. Don't quit. Don't go back. Don't turn around. No, press on in the gospel of Jesus Christ. So, again, he has explained the gospel for us. Now it's time, he says, to press on in the gospel, to to move forward in the gospel, to commit to the gospel, to go all the way with the gospel. No turning back. And the question is, since we're looking at the application of this, how do we do just that? In an era where there were once many people gathered with us in the building, worshiping with us who are no longer here, how how do we stop from doing that? In a time where pastors used to fill the pulpits and preach the gospel, then now they've abandoned the faith altogether. How do we keep from doing that? How how can I know, how can I know that I'm going to be in the gospel, serving the gospel, being faithful to the gospel until the day of the Lord Jesus Christ? And here's, here's the three things that he tells us to do. Number one, how to press on the gospel. First of all, by drawing near to God. By drawing near to God. And we, we, we find this first point of application in verse 22. Look at it there. He says, let us draw near. Specifically, let us draw near to God. What an exhortation this is. Because get this, the scripture is urging us to live our lives in the presence of God. And we have to back up and say, after all we've studied the last several chapters, is how is that even possible? Because what we've been studying is how that we are separated from the presence of God. We've been banished from the presence of God. And there's been only one who's ever been allowed to go in to the holy place where the presence of God is. And now, all of a sudden, we get invited and encouraged to go into the presence of God and stay in the presence of God and live in the presence of God. Well, how is that possible? And he answers that for us in verse number 19. Look at it. He says, therefore, brethren, we have this boldness, this confidence, look at this, to enter the holiest. What was the holy place? That was the place God's presence dwelt, the place nobody else could go except for the high priest once a year. And if he didn't go in the right way, he was going to be dead, if you know what I mean. So now all of a sudden, the place where people fear to go in lest they die, he says that we can confidently march in and we can boldly enter. How again is this possible? Look at the rest of the verse. Well, it's possible by the blood of Jesus Christ. In other words, we can confidently and boldly access God because of the blood of Jesus that was shed for our sins. Verse 20 says that we're also able to enter because this is a new and living way. The old way was through the priest. Nobody could go in. But now we have a new way. We call this the new covenant. And we get to go into the presence of God. Look at verse 20. Through the veil. Through the veil. Now what was the veil? The veil was the large 
veil that divided the holy place from the most holy place. And again, only the high priest could go under strict or, or strict qualifications. He was the only one who could go through the veil into the presence of God. And again, if he didn't go the right way, he would die in the presence of God. But now what he's saying is we all can go in. We all get to peel back the veil. We all get to go into the presence. And how do we get to go in? Through the veil. Well, what's the veil? He says the veil is the flesh of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the veil. And no longer are we kept out of the presence of God. No longer are we separated from the presence of God. Jesus, through his blood and his body on the cross at Calvary, has made a way for us to go into the presence of God through Jesus Christ. This is why on the day that Jesus Christ died on the cross, we read in Matthew chapter 27 that the veil, the curtain in the temple, it was torn in two. It was symbolic. God had torn the veil in two to remind us now, everybody who goes through Jesus, who goes through Jesus can get into the presence of God. You see, the door to God's presence this morning is wide open. And we enter through the door through Jesus Christ alone. He's the one, verse 21, who has become our high priest, giving us access to God. And he's the one who said we can, we can go in. Jesus has done all of this by virtue of his sacrificial death and his shed blood. He died and rose again so that you and I can go into the presence of God through him. We get to go in with Jesus. This is the glory of the gospel, church. For where sin banished us from God's presence, all of us, Christ's sacrificial death brought us in to God's presence. And this is the first step to pressing on in the gospel. It is seeing what Christ has done for us by giving us access to God and then choosing to live our lives in God's presence. It is choosing to go through the veil through Jesus and Jesus alone, so that we might live our lives always in the presence of God. This is what it means when he says, because of Jesus doing all of this, let us draw near. <laughs> let us go into the place which was once forbidden, that was made accessible by Jesus Christ. You have no excuse. Let us go in through Jesus and live our lives in the presence of God. And the question often comes is, well, what in the world does that mean, Pastor, to, to live in the presence of God? I thought God is omnipresent. He's everywhere. It's true. But when the Bible talks about living in God's presence, it is a unique spiritual experience. It's a life. I, I kind of wrote this down in my notes. To live in the presence of God is to experience the reality of God in an intimate and transformative way. I'm going to say that again because it's very important. To live our lives in the presence of God is to experience the reality of God, the realness of God in an intimate and transformative way. That as we draw near to God, his presence becomes more and more a reality to us. And as his presence becomes more and more a reality to us, we begin to experience his grace and his power and his wisdom every day of our lives. Why? Because we are drawing near to God. He is now drawing near to us. And that is the wonderful promise of James 4.8. That if you draw near to God, guess what happens? He doesn't withhold himself. No, he draws near to us. He draws near to us. As we get close to God, God gets close to us. And that's what it means to live in the presence. Uh, get close to God. Draw near to God. Well, how do I do that? I'm living every day conscientiously of his presence in my life. I'm walking in his word. I'm praying. I'm, I'm worshiping God every day. I am trying to get as close to God as I possibly can, believing the promise that as I get close to God, he's going to get close to me. And as I get close to him, he gets close to me, and I feel his grace and his power and his wisdom. 
wisdom and his guidance and his peace and everything that he promises me. The heavenly blessings of God fall upon my life in the here and now. And I look forward to the sweet by and by in which it all becomes a reality. It's Christ's presence there. It's Christ's presence here. That's what it means to live in the presence of God. And he says we can experience the realness of God's presence when we draw near to him. Look at it there in your Bibles. With a true heart, that's sincerely, drawing near to God sincerely, sincerely. When we draw near to God with a true heart in full assurance of faith. So we are to draw near him sincerely and assuredly, assuredly. So look right here. God doesn't want you to hesitate when it comes to him. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Can I go in? Yes. He not only wants you to go in, he wants you to walk in there covered in Jesus Christ confidently, boldly, with a true heart, filled with the assurance of faith in your life, knowing this is exactly where God wants you to be. Think about it. God wants us. By virtue of our faith in Jesus Christ to live in his presence and to live there with the certainty, friend, the certainty that our sins have been forgiven and that we belong to him. I wonder this morning, do you have that assurance? Do you live every day of your life in the presence of God with absolute certainty that your sins have been forgiven? He said, Pastor, I, 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 I struggle with that because I... I sin, and I, I, I don't do a really good job. You see, that, that's the thing with assurance, okay? Assurance is never going to come to your heart as long as you and I are focused on ourselves and our performances. Guess what? Jonathan don't perform good every day. I sin. I mess up. I have every right for Jesus to take his salvation away from me. I'm thankful he doesn't, but he has every right to do that for me. If I'm constantly looking at me and my performance and how I'm doing, it is going to be a miserable Christian life. But assurance doesn't come by looking at ourselves. Assurance doesn't come by looking at how we perform. No, assurance comes when we look at Jesus and his promises in our lives. That even when I don't perform well, that even when I mess up, that even when I sin, God has promised to hold me fast and never let me go. That's where assurance comes from. You may be sitting here this morning, you say, Pastor, my faith is weak. Your faith may be weak, but your assurance of salvation is not in the strength or intensity of your faith. It is in the object of your faith. Who is it that you believe in? Do you believe in yourself and only yourself? Well, you're always going to flounder. But if you believe in Jesus and Jesus alone, if he is the object of your faith, then you can walk into the presence of God with full Heart of assurance that this is where God wants me to be and this is where God wants me to leave, even when I'm weak, even when I'm struggling, even when I'm a hot mess. I'm thankful for that promise. And we do that because the rest of the verse says Jesus has cleansed our hearts from an evil conscience. We've identified with him in baptism and now, now in the full assurance of faith, we get close to God. And let's not lose sight of what we're talking about this morning. How do we not quit, as Keegan said? How do we press on in the gospel? The first step is we draw near to God. We get close to God. We're in his word every day. Are you in his word every day? Are you praying? Are you worshiping? Are you singing? Listen, listen, you're walking a dangerous line if you're not walking in the nearness of God. Press on, press on by being intimate, by being intimate with God. Every day of your life. Secondly, we press on by holding fast our confession. We press on by holding fast our confession. We go back to verse 23. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope. The confession of our hope. The, the essence of this exhortation is this. Be strong. Hold fast. Hold fast. Be strong in the confession that you've made. Do you remember the day that you confessed Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Do, do you remember the day that your heart and mind was chained from a hopeless future to a hope-filled life? Yeah, does it mean that our problems go away, that our burdens are no longer there? It means our perspective changes. God has given me life and salvation. We've confessed that Jesus Christ is the Messiah, that he is our Savior, that we are righteous, not of our own, but because of his doing. This is what the writer is saying. Don't let go of that confession. 
Hold on to it. Hold on to it strongly and stay focused on the hope that you have in Christ. You see, following Christ is a life of hope. He gives us hope regarding our past. He gives us hope in our journeys through the present. He gives us hope in anticipating the future. And we don't want anything to ever take our focus off of the hope that we have in Christ. This is why he says that our confession, again, what's a confession? A confession is a verbal declaration of the reality of our hearts. That's what a confession is. It is verbally declaring the reality of our hearts. There was a day that if you're a Christian this morning, you confessed publicly, verbally with your mouth that the Lord Jesus Christ is your Savior. You are confessing that on the basis of your faith, the basis on the reality of your heart. That's what a confession is. And he says we are to hold on to this confession without wavering. Hope, hope in the promises of God without wavering. It literally means without swerving. Keep your eyes focused. That which is fixed in Jesus, don't swerve from that. Don't, don't get offline. No, you, you keep going. You hold strongly. You hold fast your confession of him and keep your eyes on him. I'll be honest with you. I can't help but think about this idea of swerving without thinking about my wife's driving. No, I'm kidding. It's actually my driving. Now, when we're swerving while we're driving, it means we're not focused. There are going to be many reasons for that, right? Our hands are not 10 and 2, as Mama said when you were 16, 10 and 2, 10 and 2. We're not looking straight ahead. No, no, no. If we're, if we're not paying attention, if we're not focused on the object in front of us, we're going to swerve, we're going we're gonna to get offline a little bit. My, my kids have a bad habit of correcting my driving. Whether they're in the back of the truck or the back of the car, they'll occasionally speak up and say, Oh, Daddy, you're not supposed to cross two yellow lines. Mama said you're not supposed to cross two yellow lines. <laughs> well, Mama's not here. Shut up. Now, if that ever happens, one side or the other, it usually means we're fidgeting with the radio, or we got a text message and we're looking, kids are fighting in the back, shut up, come on, please, I can't wait to get you home. See, the implication here is that if we are going to press on in the gospel, we must stay focused on the confession that has brought us hope in Christ. We can't be swerving. There's a lot of things that cause you to swerve. Swerve. We pay too much attention to the media and not to Scripture. When we make our decisions as Christian people on the basis of our political party instead of the unity of Jesus Christ, we're swerving. It could be suffering. It could be a host of different things. But he says, one day you are going to drop off. You're going to go into wreckage. You're going to stop if you don't keep your eyes focused on Christ and pressing forward in the gospel without wavering, without swerving. And the question is, is this really possible? I mean, is it really possible to live our lives without swerving? I think the Holy Spirit knew we'd confront ourselves with that very question. Because if it was dependent on us, then we know we'd fail. So he adds a very important line here at the very end of verse 23. As we are holding fast the confession of our hope without swerving, without wavering, we are doing so because he is faithful that promised or he who promised this thing to us is faithful. The reason we're able to hold fast our confession is solely because he who promised to keep us faithful is faithful to keep us. It's because of his faithfulness that we have the focus, the strength, and the perseverance to hold fast our confession. And so 
He exhorts us to hold on, not because it is dependent upon us. He's saying, no, hold on to you. And while you think you're the one holding on, I just want to let you know, below the surface of your heart, it's the hand of God who's holding on to you. And when you feel like you're going to let go, the hand of God comes to the true believer, and he says, I'm never going to let you go. I'm always going to hold on. You hold on because I'm holding on to you. He promised he would. And he who made the promise is faithful to never let go. You see, that, my friend, is where our hope lies. Our hope does not lie in us. Our hope lies in the faithfulness of God who has promised to keep his true children from swerving into spiritual wreckage. So in a time when you're tempted to drift and turn back, a time where you may feel like you're going to throw in the towel and Quit this gospel stuff altogether. The writer of Hebrews urges us to press on in the gospel. And the way that we press on is by drawing near to God and by holding fast, strong our confession of who He is. There's a third one here. And that is if we are going to press on, and I think this is so applicable, so applicable even for the day in which you and I live today. Turmoil, pandemics, persecutions that are only going to increase and intensify as we get closer to the coming of the Lord. That we understand what it takes in Jesus to press on. Staying in his presence, holding fast our confession, and then thirdly, devoting ourselves to the church. Devoting ourselves to the church. So this is where we come to verse 24. Look at it there in your Bibles. Let us consider one another to provoke or stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some do, but exhorting one another. And so much more as you see the day approaching. So the writer is telling us how, how to press on in the gospel. And frankly, he's very clear. You don't press on in the gospel when you neglect to devote yourself to the local church. Do you understand the challenge I have in coming to such a vital text in the Christian life on Sunday, September the 5th? The Sunday before Labor Day. (laughs) There are those who profess a faith in Christ and have went as far as to publicly commit to this fellowship. Who've now become disconnected. Unfaithful. And have practically given up meeting together with the church of any kind. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. When it comes to a passage like this, those individuals need a spiritual awakening before they abandon Christ altogether. And so one sense, we've got the proverbial spiritual kick in the pants that needs to happen occasionally. It's also Labor Day weekend. And among our church family... There are faithful, devoted members of this local church who just quite honestly needed a little vacation away this weekend. I personally was supposed to leave as soon as this church was over with with, to go to the happiest place on earth. But God intervened and gave us a baby instead, (laughs) which is the happiest place on earth. There's no Mickey Mouse bars involved, but we're happy. Curtis and Betty are celebrating their 50th wedding anniversary in Alaska right now. And praise the Lord that they get to do it. I hate them that they didn't take us. (laughs) There are also devoted members of this church who, because of serious illness, cannot possibly meet with us today. Shut in. Lee Fitzgerald, who would love nothing more than to be with this church family. Is closer to meeting Jesus than many of us are. 
Laris Brown, who would love nothing more than to be here, but, but she can't be here. So, put yourself in my shoes for a moment. The great challenge for me is to somehow make that first group feel very uncomfortable in their disobedience to Christ in neglecting to meet together with the church while at the same time making sure the obedient and devoted believers understand that their absence this morning in Alaska or at home being bedridden is not being poked at by arrows of guilt from their pastor. And then I have to wrap all of this up into a big word of encouragement for those of you who are here this morning because we know that you are here because you've dismissed everything else in order to prioritize this gathering of the church. Some of you think it's so easy being a pastor. It's not as easy as you think. But this is where we are. And as much as I looked up to God on several occasions over the last couple of weeks, knowing that I was coming to Hebrews 10.25 on Labor Day weekend, I said, really? I mean, this is no joke. I'm sitting at my office desk. I'm looking. I'm thinking, I say, where will I be? Uh, Labor Day, God? Like, this, this is who you want to hear this? The decline in church attendance among professing Christians is greater and faster than it has ever been before. And here's what we need to know. That was a fact. Before the pandemic. I could take you to the, to the numbers and the research and the articles. I don't have to do that. You can look that up for yourself. Since the pandemic, it has gone down a third more faster than it was prior to. And by the way, we, 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 don't, we don't need a research firm to tell us why. Jesus has already tell us, told us why. When you study Mark chapter 4, Matthew chapter 13, Luke chapter 23, I believe it is, you're going to find Jesus telling a story about the parable of the sower. That as the word of God goes out, some, it falls on good ground, and they believe it, and they press on in the gospel all the days of their life. Some receive it initially, but when things get tough, when the going gets rough, what happens? They get going. So Jesus has already explained to us why this happens. And of course, the context of this exhortation in Hebrews chapter 10 tells us a great deal also, looking again at the framework of the book. Why is he having to tell them not to stop meeting? Fear, convenience, and a lack of spiritual intimacy. They weren't drawing near to God. All of those things had caused those who were once meeting regularly to now stop meeting together. When I look at Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24 through 25, I want you to notice a couple things. One, this is not just about the public corporate gathering. Okay? I'll try to explain this. It, it is about the public gathering, but it is not more than that until it is first that. You got it? If you don't, it's okay. I'm not sure I do either. The, the, the point is, before we start talking about home fellowship groups and coffee with other believers, he's saying it begins in the public corporate gathering that you and I are in this morning. Let, let, let me prove that to you. In verse 25, he says, don't forsake the assembling of ourselves together. That word assembling, assembling, is an interesting Greek word. I'm going to say the Greek word for you, okay? I want you to listen. It's the Greek word episunagogue. Episunagogue. Sound familiar? Listen closely. Epi, ding, 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 you get the $10,000 prize. Episynagogue. It is. It's synagogue. Synagogue. So implied in this very word assembly is the idea that Christians will come together in one building for prayer, worship, teaching, and encouragement. That is if we are to press on in the gospel. Now, is that the only time? No, it's not. We also come together on our own for dinner, for coffee. For a run, for a walk, for a game of golf, for prayer, for scripture reading, for encouragement. We do what we can in here and we do what we can out there because that's how collectively we press on in the gospel. Church, by its very design, biblically, is anti-isolation. 
There's no such thing in the New Testament epistles as a churchless Christian. You won't find it. That's why you've heard me say on many occasions that there's no such thing as an online church. We don't have church online. That's an oxymoron. There's the gathered church. But there's no online church. Because the Bible says the church gathers. It assembles in the synagogue. It it meets together. Even the word saint, look it up for yourself. The word saint in the New Testament is never used in the singular form. It's always used in the original in a plural form. Showing us that the Bible assumes togetherness among believers. It assumes that we will come together in the plural sense. I know what some of you are thinking. You're thinking, well, Pastor, I don't have to go to church to be a Christian. Maybe. But you don't have to go home to be married either. And one thing is for sure. If you don't go home with your spouse after you marry her or him, it'll prove that what relationship you thought you had turned out to be no relationship at all. And we're not even getting into this morning the whole no contract, no commitment necessary culture we live in, which is, you know, if you don't give me, Pastor, what I'm looking for in the church, then I'm going to go move into the other one down the road. You treat your wife that way? You don't cook my eggs just right? See, I'm moving out with her. The sad is some people do think that way. If I thought that way, you'd already have my funeral. You see, there's a direct correlation here corporately when we think about meeting with God. A direct correlation between our drawing near to God privately and personally and our drawing near to God corporately and publicly. That is, if we are living in God's presence, we want to be with God's people in togetherness. I I just don't get it. I don't get how people profess that they love Christ, but they don't love his bride. It just doesn't make sense to me. If you love basketball, you're going to watch basketball. You're going to play basketball. You're going to get together with the guys who do basketball. Don't don't tell me you love Jesus and don't care for this. It's not biblical. And there's a reason for that. Because we need this if we're going to press on in the gospel. You think I'm saying these things because this is my job? Pastor, you have to preach of faithfulness because if we didn't come, you'd have any of pre- Listen, listen. As of July 25th, I will always have at least six people to preach to. <laughs> always. I'm working on a football team. <laughs> but whether I preach to six this morning or 600, it is not about my job. It's about helping you as your shepherd finish. It's about helping you to understand that I'm where you're at when you're discouraged and you want to quit and you're wondering if it's even worth it all. It's about coming together in this body of believers and being reminded every week of my life it is worth it and I can finish. And with God's help and God's people, I will press on in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Here's what I want you to see in God's desire for us. We'll mention these two things and we'll be done and you'll be glad. Number one. God designed the Christian life for us to need one another. And I put that emphasis on need. Some of us men especially, we don't like to think we're needy. But man, you're needy. You get the sniffles. Your wife will tell you, you're needy. God has designed the Christian life for us to need one another. It is impossible to be a healthy, persevering Christian while purposely isolating ourselves and not attending the gatherings of the church. And the writer of Hebrews understood this. He's saying, you will not press on in the gospel without devoting yourself to the church. Because when we are devoted to the church, look what it does. Look at your Bible there, verse 24. The first thing is it it, it gives us faultful relationships. He says, let us consider one another. That's what the word consider means. It means Thoughtful, thoughtful, uh, thoughtful toward one another. Thoughtful relationships. It's, it's the antithesis of isolation. 
The very fact that we come together is a message that God wants you to know that we're not to live the Christian life selfishly. We need each other. I know that's hard for us to hear, especially those of you who are like me who are introverted by nature. I don't need anybody. I got me, myself, and I, and that's the majority, and that's the way I like it. He says, no, you need need each other. And when you come, you are to come in thoughtfulness, considering each other's spiritual needs, considering each other's weeks, considering each other's uh, struggles and weaknesses and how we can serve each other. Listen, listen, don't ever get in the habit of coming in here not talking to anybody and leaving the same way. This is not church if that's how you're treating it. What, What it is, this is entertainment hour for you. This is for somebody to to meet your need. No, no, we exist to meet each other's needs. So we come, we come prepared prayerfully. God, who can I encourage? Who can I pray for today? Who can I put my arm around? Who who can I provoke to love and good works? It's about thoughtfulness and consideration and relationship. He says we're to do this as we stir up love and good works, verse 24. I could get into the word provoke. It's interesting. In, in, in the biblical uh, context, it, it, it means both positive and negative. It's the same word that we see here used when God said uh, to fathers, fathers, don't provoke or stir up your children to wrath. So, so in one way, we can treat each other in a way that stimulates faithfulness and grace and righteousness. In another way, we can exasperate them. He's saying when you come to church, don't exasperate each other. Man, we get that enough during the week. No, come to stir up, come to, come to stimulate, help us through prayer and teaching and singing and worship to, to love God more and love each other better and serve God more and serve each other better. That's why we come together. We're trying to press on in the love of God. How do we do that? When we get together and are encouraged. You think I got up this morning wanting to be here necessarily? I think sometimes we think the pastor springs out of bed or whatever alarm his goes off and... It's a great day to be alive. Let's go to church, men and women. You know what? I hit the snooze button several times this morning, and I said to myself, do I have to go today? I did not get up with joy in my heart. I got up with a headache. That's what I got up with. And I didn't necessarily walk into this room this morning ready to bring my worship on. No, it wasn't, but halfway through Psalm 50 during the early service, I look over there and Kate is singing to the top of her lungs and Keegan's singing over there the best that he knows how to do. And then, and then, I, then I came in here and plotted myself done between these teenage boys and I said, all right, boys, it's time to sing. Let's go. Let's do this. And, and they're singing the best they can, probably weirded out by my voice. And as they're singing and he's singing and I'm singing, I just, I got in my worship mode. Why? Because that's what the church does. We would never do these things on our own, but we need each other. So we'll pray more sing better and pay attention to God's word more be faithful as God wants we need it to finish because we can't do it by ourselves I gotta move on not forsaking the assembly Christian fellowship some of you don't get this all week long you don't work with people who know Christ your conversations are politics and sports and all that's fine in its place it's not building you up It's not helping you press on. We come together because we need this. I need to know that I'm not the only one struggling this week. Just a few weeks ago, I sat right there on that back row where Miss Mirta is, and I poured my ever-loving tears out to George Riddell because I am struggling. Because he's a brother in this fellowship that I can depend on and go to and say, I need your prayers, and he prayed with me right there, and my week got better. But guess what? I had to do it the next Sunday too. Because I'm not the only one. And you're not the only one. We need each other to press on. Exhorting one another. Encouraging each other. Every person in every season. And how do we do this? As we see the day approaching. It's an emphasis here on the return and judgment of Christ. The day. That's the day. The day. If you walked up to me this morning and said, are you ready for the day? At first, I'm trying to, I'm trying to wonder here, what, what, what do you mean? Like a payday? Payday? Or, or a vacation day? Or, what, what are we talking about? No, the day, the day is when Jesus comes again. <laughs> do you know that day could be today? You're not going to think about that when you're not assembling together with the church. And when you're not thinking about the day, you get all focused, you swerve. When you're not thinking about the day, you... 
You don't necessarily sense the need to be in God's presence. You see, when we come together as church, play, church family, it helps us stay focused on Christ. That's true in the public corporate gathering. It's also true in our daily personal involvement in one another's lives. I try to text people every week, every day. People text me every, every day. I got several last night, several this morning. Calling, meeting, coffee, lunch, come over, let's talk, let's pray together. Because Jesus is coming back. And if we don't stay focused together, we might not press on. Listen to what Spurgeon, the great prince of preachers, said. Satan hates Christian fellowship. It is his policy to keep Christians apart. Anything which can divide saints from one another, he delights in. He attaches far more importance to godly relationships than even we do. Since togetherness is strength, he does his best to promote separation. And my question to you from that quote from Charles is, are you letting Satan win the battle? So here's the second thing, and we're going to... I mean it this time. We're going to be done. We don't have church on Sunday night anymore, so you can bear with me for 45 minutes. 50. God has designed the Christian life for us to need each other. And look right here. Uh, you need this. Mm, this is for me. And I know it's for you too. Here's the second thing. And we need each other more than we think we do. Isn't that what he said? So much more. More. God has designed us to be together. He's designed it in such a way that you need it more than you think you need it. Pastor, why, why, do, you, why do you tell us we need to come back on Wednesday nights if we can, our schedule allows? Because you need this fellowship more than you think you do. Why, why, why do we have these fellowship groups? You want everybody to be involved because you need this fellowship more than you think you do. <laughs> Why men Bible study? Why ladies Bible study? Because we need each other more than we think we need each other. This is something God has taught me in a very unique way this year. A pastor who's here almost every time the doors are open. I was hit head on this year with the fact that I cannot live this Christian life on my own. And i got to keep from bottling it up in here that, that, that I need the church, I need you to help me, to, to encourage me, to, to show me the love and grace of Christ. I have a great need for that. And that great need will never be met through a computer screen or a television screen. It will only be met when we come together and stir each other in love and good work so that we can finish. Pastor, you're kidding me. You've never thought about quitting. Let's have a cup of coffee. And I'm not just talking about quitting pastoring. Pastoring is just what I do. It's not who I am. I'm talking about moments when I, you know, it's all. All this stuff I've been saying, is it, is it real? Do I really think I can make it all the way serving Christ? And then that's when God puts people in our lives to show us that, <laughs> that not on our own we're not. You see, the point is, you need each other and you need it, we need it, more than we think we do. You see, there's something that concerns me more than social distancing. It's spiritual distancing. The former may prevent an infection. But the latter, let's be honest, can bring spiritual abandonment. So we ought to be doing everything in our power to meet together instead of making excuses for why we can't. It's not only disobedient to God, but to purposefully absent yourself from meeting regularly with this church is to deprive yourself of your greatest spiritual needs. Those you didn't even realize you had. 
So I echo to the church at Laurel this morning what the writer of Hebrews was writing to the church of the Hebrews and what I think is Rome. Don't give up meeting together. Because if you give up meeting together, there's a good chance you'll give up on the gospel altogether. We need it. And we need it more than we think we do. Brothers and sisters, the number of once professing Christians who are turning away from God today are staggering. And the question we always ask ourselves is, how did that even happen? How did that even happen? Well, it's because they didn't press on in the gospel, the gospel that was taught to them. Their intimacy with God was non-existent. Is this ringing a bell with anybody? Their intimacy with God was non-existent. They lost hope in his promises, and then they eventually gave up on meeting together with the church. So how do we press on in the gospel without turning back? How do we keep ourselves from coming that casualty? By drawing near to God, by walking through the door of Jesus Christ and living our lives in His salvation, in His presence. By holding fast our confession without wavering and by devoting ourselves to the church as faithfully as God gives us the grace to do so. The winds are blowing out there. And they're blowing stronger than ever. And, and I'm not talking about this nice, cool week we've had for the last few days. If you're new to our area, I've got some bad news for you. <laughs> you see, what happens in North Carolina is we get what we call a fake fall. Okay? We've been living at the gates of hell for the last two months. We get a few days of fake fall. And I'm, 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 I hate to tell you this, but next week we are going back to the gates of hell. It is only after we go back the second time that we realize real fall is here, okay? Give it a couple more weeks and we'll be there. But it hadn't felt nice. Winds blowing, cool mornings. It's not what I'm talking about, though. I'm talking about the winds of persecution on American soil like we've never seen it before. I'm talking about the winds of temptation. I'm talking about the winds of pandemics and fears and all these other sort of things. The winds are blowing strong, church, and they're blowing stronger than they've ever blown before. And if you're not anchored in Christ, it's going to carry you away. So may we heed the warning to press on in the gospel and to do it by drawing near to him holding fast our confession and devoting our lives and families to the church that we need to help us get there. Let's stand together for prayer this morning.